Hi there. My name is Rafael Menko, and I wanted to just give you a short video that will highlight and explain some of the lessons that we've learned from creating millions, uh, probably somewhere north of 15, 20 million short response answers from students all the way as young as pre-K levels, all the way through 12th grade. There's a lot we've learned, and given how common short response is becoming in, state, in high stakes tests and how common it is now across the curriculum, I, I wanted to, to share some of the takeaways that we've learned. So I'm one of the co-founders at Who's Reading, and uh, like all of us at Who's Reading, we've, we've read millions, or not personally, but you know, over the years, we've all looked at hundreds and probably thousands of responses that students have written to open-ended questions. So we've learned a lot, and there's a lot of takeaways I wanna share with you. Um, but I think a good place to start is just realizing that we are now living in a time where short response assessments are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. I've SBAC park test, uh, apparently the star test in Texas is now going to be 25% uh, uh, short response across all subject areas, math included. I, and it just, it's the new, new time. And I, you know, there are pros and cons. It's, you know, one of the cons is it's hard to teach to. Um, you know, it's, it's a much more cognitively demanding skill than multiple choice. Um, but then there's a lot of upsides. I mean, it, it demands higher depth of, depth of knowledge for students, more critical thinking skills. And this is what we need to be successful in the 21st century. It requires more writing. Communication is, again, a very core 21st century skill. And text event analysis, you can do it more thoughtfully uh, when you're writing and if you're, you're choosing A, B, C, D, or E. Uh, and I, I just wanted to, to put a little bit of you know, evidence to, to show just how common uh, short response is. And I think one way to sh talk about it is, is in the lens of the new expectations that you know, have kind of been around for the last six, six years. Um, and this, this, this image I think is very compelling um, because it shows that, you know, I guess first, what we're looking at is a Google Trends graph. And Google Trends, if you don't know, you just, you, you go to Google Trends and you search a term and it will show you a graph that will teach you and, and demonstrate how common an idea has been via, based on how common people are, are Google searching that, 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 uh, that word, that phrase, um, basically going all the way back to 2004 when, when Google was launched. And so if you type in the phrase, uh, text evidence, I, you, will, you will see that it, it starts out in, what, 2004, not very common. And then 2014, it skyrockets. It, it goes from, you know, 15 percentage, 20% relative to 100 scale. And, and it jumps up to, I mean, 75, 100%. And this, I think, really does a good job of helping us visualize this core skill of citing evidence and, and everything that comes along with it and just how much um, you know, the educational standards and expectations have shifted. I mean, it, it's a very drastic and extreme change. So, I mean, that's just a little bit to understand um, where we're coming from. And when you think about citing evidence, it's pretty hard to do with multiple choice. Uh, frankly, like multiple choice might, you know, is good for a lot of things, but when it comes to helping us, you know, even test this skill that we just look at of citing evidence, you're really limited in what you can do with multiple choice. And so the alternative is, is moving beyond multiple choice to having assessments that are based around short response, um, which is what we're seeing now in many state tests. So we're seeing uh, in a lot of programs. Um, and so uh, for the rest of the time, I really want to focus on if, you know, assuming that we're going to do uh, more short response in order to empower our students to cite evidence, um, do higher level text dependent analysis skills, all these things. Um, assuming we're going to do that, I want to show, you know, if in your school, in your district, you're thinking about, you know, what are the best, the best practices for ensuring that these skills are well practiced, I, I want to take you through what we've learned. And so, again, like we've looked at millions, I mean, 15 million plus, I mean, it's a low end estimate of responses that our algorithm has analyzed. And there's a lot of, you know, interesting trends that we've learned from that. 
So I think the, the three main lessons are the importance of accountability and having a consistent rubric. Um, because when students are writing, they need to know what a successful answer looks like and it needs to be consistent over time. The second piece is students need feedback. Um, you know, just, you know, you, when you write a response, you put it out in the world. We've all had that experience where we write a paper and, you know, I remember in college, I'd write papers and it would take three weeks, a month for my teacher, my professor to, to give me back my grade and my feedback. And at that time, you know, given that it's been a month, of, you know, separated from when I, you know, wrote the paper, I, I don't even remember what I'm getting marked down for. So feedback that comes, you know, in, in, a, in, you know, as close to immediate as possible, that's clear and actionable, that's, you know, pedagogical, so I know how to improve my answer or my work in the future is necessary because, you know, creative expression writing is something where, you know, we need guidance to make it better. And the third and final piece that we've learned is the importance of having scaffolds. Uh, writing is a cognitively dis difficult skill. It's a big, big, it's a much bigger challenge than, you know, uh, multiple choice, A, B, C, D. It requires a lot of skills, as, as I'm sure you all know better than I do. I'm working, you know, with students directly. And so I, we've learned that it's essential to give students lots of scaffolding, lots of support, lots of differentiation um, until they're, you know, more confident and able to do these skills well. So let's tackle the first point first, uh, accountability and a rubric. So what we've learned um, is that you can really have a solid rubric that only focuses on three things. Um, and, and these are the three that we focus on. I'm sure there's other rubrics that you might use that, that might be you know, better for, for your purposes or you know, might be similar, but just worded differently. But uh, the three things that we look at are first and foremost, um, we want to give students some sort of score or, and, and expectations for what does quality writing look like? Because after all, we are writing. So um, you know, that looks at writing mechanics, grammar, spelling, organization, all that falls under the category of writing well. So that's one set of the rubric. Another piece is citing evidence. I mean, if you're, you know, especially when it comes to, you know, reading comprehension or, or, or science, you know, talking about social studies or history, you know, the short response is often asking you to make a claim or state an opinion or, or just like share why you think a certain thing is true. The challenge is that I could say a certain thing. I, I could say that I think Harry Potter is like the coolest character in the world. But if I'm not telling you why that I think I think so, then I'm not, you know, doing a good job of citing evidence. I'm not doing a good job of, of making you understand why I think such a way. And if we're at talking about reading comprehension without evidence, we don't actually know if they've understood the content. And so asking students and having a rubric that looks at whether or not they're citing details and improving, including, including supporting details is crucial. The third step is answering all parts of the question clearly. I've, you know, we hear this all the time. Students will, you know, a question might have two parts and they'll answer one part of the question. Or maybe they'll just like kind of go off of on a random idea that has nothing to do with the prompt. And, you know, especially when we're talking about the rubrics that are used on high stakes tests, they're very specific about having students, you know, reflect the question stem in their answer. And so a huge part of the rubric that we found is necessary is making sure that we can ensure that students are, are actually addressing the question fully. And, and that's the third part. And, you know, like I said, there's a lot of different rubrics. You can might have your, your own ones, but I want to show you uh, how we've been able to visualize to teachers um, whether or not students are meeting the rubric. And again, you know, you can have your own system. Uh, you don't have to use who's reading, uh, but this is just to help stimulate some ideas. Um, so what we do is whenever a student turns in a short response question, we sort of break down those three elements of the rubric um, by giving them a low, average, or high score in all three of them. So, you know, this student in this example got a high score in all three because, you know, the writing was, you know, appropriate for his grade level. Um, enough text evidence was used. All that's being highlighted uh, by our system, by our algorithm. And um, co reading comprehension is the kind of catch all phrase we use for are you clearly answering the question? And, the student is doing so in this case. So that's kind of how Who's Reading goes about demonstrating this information. Um, so that brings us to our second part, feedback. Uh, feedback is, I would say, 
possibly the most important part because that's where it goes from being an assessment that's just focused on, you know, you got a 70%, you got a check plus, uh, to actually being a pedagogical educational tool where we're able to help students understand what to work on next. And uh, there's, you know, four elements of feedback that we find are, we've learned are really important. The first is the feedback has to be specific. It has to tell the student what specifically in their answer can be improved or what is specifically missing. Because we want them to be able to go back and improve their answer, which is the second part, part the opportunity to do a redo. Um, so that's very important. The third part is that the feedback is prompt. I, I, I brought up the example of you know, turning in a paper in college and not getting uh, feedback for a month, and I'm not blaming my professors uh, or, or any teacher. It, it's, it's very time consuming to get feedback. And, and like multiple choice is nice because it's automatic, but you know, we've already discussed the, you know, the shortfalls of it. Um, and so the closer you can give feedback to when the, the, the assessment was or the, the short response was, was handed in by the student, the better. And uh, there's actually a lot of really interesting research that uh, was shared to us, shared out to us by, by some researchers in the field, that there's this rule of 48 hours. And what it means is that if feedback is given after 48 hours, the educational benefit of that feedback really goes away, not 100%, but, but it, it drops down significantly. Um, and so, you know, we really have to try to get feedback as quickly as possible. And I know that's asking a lot. Um, it's asking a lot because, you know, we all and teachers have so much going on, so much on your plates that that's asking a lot. But it, it just, you know, feedback is most effective when it comes in a short manner. The last step, we kind of talked about it, but when feedback is, is not just saying this is what's wrong, but showing why it's wrong or, or, or showing how in general a student can, can learn from that skill in the future, then it's most helpful because then they're able to integrate that information and apply it in future answers. Um, feedback is you know, such an important skill. And, and these are the four steps that we found. And I just wanna help you know, give you some models of uh, things that we probably ha have given the most feedback for. So I think, so here's, here's kind of like the four that come up the most. Uh, students will, you know, give a vague answer. I call it the, the politician answer where you kind of say like a really nice abstract idea. You maybe write really well, but then you don't provide evidence or details to support your statement. That's a super common area of feedback that we provide students with. A second thing that tends to come up in a lot of students' responses is that they're not answering all parts of the question. You know, they address one part or two parts or none of that. Um, so, you know, reminding students to, to stay on task and, and follow the expectations uh, is, is crucial. Third part, I guess, kind of ties into that is just when they ignore the question entirely and just write what they want to write. Uh, fourth, uh, kind of is a catch-all for a lot of mechanical errors. Maybe students are spelling uh, words consistently wrong or, or there's a lot of capitalization issues. So those are the four areas that we see the most of. And just to give you a visual of how we, we show students feedback, um, the typical way it'll go is, you know, students will, will submit their answer. I, you know, I thought the book would involve a lot of running, kind of a vague answer. Uh, and so what we'll say is I'm confused about how your answer relates to Maniac McGee, making it clear that it's specific to their answer, try including details and evidence from the book. And kind of below that is a bit, it's not in the screen, but you can, uh, we'll explain what it means to, you know, we'll show examples of answers where evidence is included so that they have that pedagogical um, explanation of how to do this, how to do that skill well. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's pretty much, we try to give it as, you know, immediately. Um, so before they submit their quiz or their answer, they have the opportunity to, you know, integrate the feedback. We found that students about 2.1 times We'll, we'll, we'll take the feedback before submitting a response because, you know, after submitting this answer, there might be another issue. Maybe they only answered one part of the question. And so the owl will remind them to do a second part. Now you might have owls in your classrooms and that's totally fine. Um, you don't have to use our model. It, is it just, you know, what we found is specific, timely, and then it's nice that there's a little coin bonus when they do it because then students are more motivated to earn, uh, get a, another external reward if they take feedback into consideration. Um, but that's how we do it, who's reading. Final section is uh, scaffolds. 
Uh, there's, like we said at the beginning, writing is a challenging skill. It takes a lot of time to master, a lifetime, honestly, but you know, to get to competent level it takes a long time. And I, it, you know, it takes a, a lot of time from the teachers, teachers to teach the skill. Um, but the four most common scaffolds, the ones that we really rely on at Who's Reading, are sentence starters. Uh, not every student needs it, but it's a really good way to teach students on how to answer all parts of the question, to sort of give them structure and confidence to, to begin writing their answer. Because sometimes those first few words, you don't know what to put out. But if those first few words are put in for you, you, get, you kind of figure out how to, how to write the rest of, of the answer. And so that's, we found a very effective scaffold. Second is having questions that are, you know, the short response question being targeted to the, the expectations of the grade level. You know, you wouldn't want to ask a, a, a kindergarten student to cite three pieces of evidence in their answer, but for, uh, you know, an eighth grader, that might be okay. Uh, similar to that is a differentiated rubric. We want to make sure that students are having, you know, that the, the, what we're looking for in each grade level is different, or even at, at each level that a student is at, if we can really make it fine-tuned by students' individual levels. Final thing is uh, not everyone might will, will use this, but for students who have issues with typing, uh, having a text to a speech to text transcribing ability, and there's a lot of nice free tools out there that allow you to do that, help, uh, really goes a long way because uh, then students can feel like they're they're writing or or like you know at least you know practicing their their communication skills, uh, and then. As a teacher, you could see what's being you know, spoken out, but then they don't have the, the frustration of having to type if that's something that's very, very hard for them to do. Uh, so here's an example of a sense starter that we include, uh, which is you know, something you could turn on for your students on who's reading. I, you know, what is a fact you'll remember from the book? We fill in the first part. One fact from this book I will always remember is, and students are responsible for the second part. If the question has two parts, there'll be two scaffolds. Again, like this is just, helping the students who are struggling with writing kind of take those first steps. And the goal is that maybe after a month or two of sentence starters, you can actually remove them uh, because then students will, you know, have really integrated the structure, uh, the proper organization into their answers. Uh, so the way we, we provide a, a differentiated rubric is, um, is it just, I know there's a lot of text on this page and that's not, ideal for a slideshow, but I wanted to, to be very specific because I think this is an area where it's important to be specific. Um, these are examples of the rubrics that we have at each grade level. So for, um, you know, every answer in this case is scored out of two points. So um, an answer that gets maximum credit at the, se at the second grade level, you know, it includes, you know, two to three sentences. You're restating an answer in the question fully with one to two details from the text. When you jump up to fourth and fifth grade, you know, expectation is three to four sentences, restating answers, uh, uh, restating and answering the question fully, and then including two or more details from the text. So you can see this is gradually expecting more of students. Um, again, like you might have a different system that you want to use, uh, a different, you know, your own uh, expectations, but, but I, I, we find that, you know, making them gradually increase and being very specific goes a long way for helping students understand what's expected from them and also keeping it manageable within the level that they're at. And on who's reading, uh, we make it so that even if a student's at a, you know, say a sixth grade level, um, they could be shown, they could be, tr uh, they could be graded and shown questions at a second grade level or whatever level that they're at. So even, you know, you know, if they're at a certain grade level, they could be experiencing the program at a, you know, a higher grade level or a lower grade level, depending on, you know, what, what you know about their, their skill set. So finally, uh, there's, you know, if you go to the Chrome store, uh, there's a lot of free tools that allow you to, you know, turn your voice into text um, to help those students who, who need that assistance and have trouble with uh, keyboarding. Uh, on Who's Reading, we, we have a little microphone at the bottom of each of the question, you know, answer forms, and also a recorder that will read the answer out loud. So if you click on the microphone, you can have your voice just immediately turn to text so that, you know, we have that for those students. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of tools. You go to the Chrome store, uh, this voice to text, speech texter.com seems to be pretty popular. Um, and yeah, I mean, that will allow for those students who, who need that help to not have to write the answers, type those answers themselves. So yeah, I mean, that's just the, 
general overview on on short response i think that the key takeaways are that you know short response is, is here it, it's the way to assess and while it is hard to do it, it's going to take our kids our, our students to a better place um you know the the skills that, that we need in the workforce today that we use in college and beyond are very much focused on writing on demonstrating understanding through our own independent thoughts and Multiple choice isn't going to get us there. And, and today we're in a world where it's, you know, half multiple choice, maybe, you know, a third, you know, two thirds multiple choice, a third short response. Maybe it'll stay that way. Maybe it'll become more short response. But I think it's, it's, a, it's doing a service to our, our students by giving them practice regularly at answering these questions um, that, you know, require text evidence that require writing. And the three things that, that matter the most are giving clear expectations, a clear rubric on what's expected, um, making sh and the second thing is making sure that students are getting quality and prompt feedback. And the third thing is that we make sure that students are you know, getting the scaffolds that they need to go from you know, maybe not being a competent writer today to being a very competent writer in three months or one year from now. Uh, so you know, we have a lot of these features at Who's Reading, but a lot of these you probably can create yourselves. Um, so I hope this was helpful and informative and uh, you can always email me at Raphael at who's reading.org. If you have questions on anything in this video or, or questions on, you know, I kind of just skimmed the surface of what we've learned about um, short response and constructive response. Uh, but I'm happy to answer more questions. So uh, thanks for, for taking the time to watch this video and uh, wishing you all the best.